Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2019 release, The Lodge. And uh, I know a lot of people out there have said this is a bleak film. It is a bleak film, but what is, well, you know, what's horror for? Uh, this is going to be a spoiler review, even though it just came out in 2019. I feel like it kind of warrants spoilers, because then I can't really talk about a whole lot, to be honest. Um, it would be a very short review if I didn't do spoilers. So know that up front if you have interest in watching this film, which I think it is a good film. It's not like my favorite film. I think it's well done. I think it's good. I'm going to give it a, a good rating. Um, I would just say stop right here. Go watch it. I watched it on Hulu when I'm recording this review. Uh, it just hit Hulu kind of recently, so it should be on there for a bit. So let's get into it. The Lodge was directed by Severin Fiala and Veronica Franz, who did the film's Good Night Mommy, which is actually streaming at the moment on the Shutter streaming service. And I think I saw that a long time ago. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, and The Field Guide to Evil, which I have not seen and don't really know anything about. Uh, it was written by Fiala Franz and a person by the name of Sergio Koski, uh, which doesn't he doesn't really have any other like feature length film writing credits on IMDb, so I don't have that information to give. Uh, the main star of this playing Grace is Riley Keough. She's done films such as The Runaways, Kiss of the Damned, Mad Max Fury Road, It Comes at Night, which I do plan on watching because it's on Netflix, and The House That Jack Built, which I think is also on Hulu at the moment, and I do plan to see as well, so I'll see some more of her work. Uh, Koski wrote the original script for this and then sold it to Hammer Films, because this is a Hammer film. Uh, who offered it to, Hammer then offered it to Fiala and Franz to do, and then they actually rewrote a bunch of it, including the ending of the film. I don't know I, what the actual initial ending was supposed to be. I didn't look that up because going into the film, I do all my research before seeing the film, going into it, I don't look for plot spoilers or anything like that. So just know there was going to be a different ending initially, and the ending that's in there is Fiala and Franz's uh, touch, so... If you've seen it, which I assume, I mean, I hope you've seen it if you're going this far in this. So Martell and McHugh, who were the kids, and yes, the boy was in the It films as Bill, um, the kid with the stutter. Uh, so Martell and McHugh, the kids, were actually taken out before the production of it to do rock climbing and ice skating together because they actually wanted them to fit, to like form a friendly bond so they could actually on set kind of act more like brother and sister and actually have, you know, an actual relationship going into the filming. And they figured that would really help them with their acting and, um, you know, kind of put that into their characters. Now, that said, they also made sure that they kept Riley Keough from the kids so that they could uh, maintain that kind of distance on the set and with the characters. They felt like that would really help the kids not, you know, trust her as much, which obviously that's intended with... Aiden and Mia as the kids in this to not trust Grace. Not, I mean, the whole time, basically. So I thought, I mean, maybe that worked. It sounded like an interesting idea to do that. Uh, the film was shot in Montreal in an, in an actual lodge on a golf resort that happened to be closed for the winter. I think the shooting location is really good. It looks really good. Uh, it looks appropriately cold and frigid and isolated. So they did a good job with scouting the location. Uh, they actually filmed the the movie in chronological order, which actually doesn't happen a whole lot. And I'm assuming that that was done mainly to kind of help with the progression of the characters and the actors as they played those characters to kind of really feel as things start to slowly fall apart. I feel like it's it's probably a lot harder if you kind of do something further on and then you go backwards when you're filming uh, because it can kind of confuse the actors and they'll be like, okay, at what stage of like falling apart am I right now? Because I just played a section of being like totally undone and now we need to go back and I need to be like pretty with it. I, it that's got to be hard to kind of make that switch. So filming chronologically makes a lot of sense to get a better performance. Um, and like I said, that's not done a whole lot because usually they do it out of order to kind of maximize um, efficiency of the shooting time and budget as well. So the t cinematographer for this, I think is important to note because it's Themios Bakatakis who worked with Yorgos Lanthimos. And I believe he was also the cinematographer for 
uh, the killing of a sacred deer, which I did a review for recently on the channel. You can check that out. I love that film. So going into this and knowing that that was the cinematographer, uh, sorry, cinematographer, I was fully expecting that this film would look very good from a cinematography standpoint, and I was correct. It does look really good. The shots are always very interesting. They have some cool angles. The framing of it is always really nice, and there's always a good amount to kind of look at within the shot. It's not just all about the characters. It's about the shapes and the other things in the environment behind them and next to them, and they it looks good. Okay, so let's get into the actual film. Uh, the opening shots going through the lodge with the eerie music seems to be very, very bleak. The lighting is extremely cold, and it gives you just a very cold, dead feeling. Um, and it's kind of like, it, it made me feel like, I feel like this is a foreshadowing of how the film is going to end. It gave me that kind of feeling. You know, there are a lot of movies out there. Well, not a lot, but there are a decent amount of movies out there that start with the ending, basically. They'll give you a little snippet in the very beginning of something that happens at the end of the film. And then they start the film from the beginning of the story, and they'll show you how do we get here. And that's kind of what that felt like to me when they showed it, because why else would they be showing something like that? Um, so I felt like, okay, this is showing, you know, that the lodge is kind of empty, it's very quiet, it's very cold looking, they show the gun as well, I felt like that was clearly alluding to the fact that things are going to go very, very badly and be, be very bleak, so it sets you up pretty well for that. But then, you know, it gets a little bit lighter for like a minute or so, basically, until Alicia Sil Silverstone blows her brains out, which I saw that coming as soon as she was, um... Uh, as soon as she sat down at her table and poured herself some wine, I was like, there's something off here. And then as soon as she started to like undo her necklace, that's when I was like, oh, she's killing herself. She's about to kill herself. But prior to that, I saw her and I was like, oh, cool, Alicia Silverstone. Uh, she was just in the, the Killing of a Sacred Deer, which I had watched a few weeks ago. And I was like, cool, it's great to see her getting more, um, more roles and then I was like great hopefully this is a larger role than the killing of a sacred deer and then it wasn't and then I was just like oh um okay that didn't take long just like the killing of a sacred deer she was in it barely at all so it was exciting to see her again to see her getting more work but I don't know do people not think she can carry a film is she is she just like a, a small part actress at this point I hope not yeah so the family, obviously, because of the death of the mother, the family is fractured immediately. That's a very clear way to set it up, saying this family is hurting, this family is basically destroyed immediately. And actually, it's a terrible point to bring in another person. Uh, so Richard, the father, the idea to then go away, to get away and bring his new girlfriend, who he was going to be marrying... Um, it's, it's bad timing. He really should have had the ability to kind of step back and say, um, even if I do want to marry this person, I think this should be put on hold. I shouldn't tell the kids about this at this point. They're obviously grieving the death of their mother, uh, let alone say, Hey, let's go have a getaway where we'll all go to the lodge. Uh, you can spend time with this person that you don't like is obviously not your mother. And then I'll leave on top of that. And you'll just be left there with this person. So uh, from an actual like real life standpoint, it doesn't make sense. So there are kind of some plot holes in that sense, but it's a horror film. So things have to go wrong. You know, you don't get to the, the powerful message and the powerful film that, that is here without Richard being a terrible parent and being unrealistic with his choices. So, which are, you know, they're very selfish. Because uh, obviously he's he seems very disconnected from what his kids are actually going through in order to be that insensitive to, to bring her along and everything. And be like, oh, and since your mother just died, let me tell you, I'm going to marry this woman. Bad timing, Richard. There's a reason that the, the, uh, the short for Richard is dick. Um, so yeah. Uh, da -da -da -da. The cult video that Aiden and Mia end up watching reminds me a lot of the Heaven's Gate cult, and I think they probably took a lot of um, inspiration from that because in the video I see a lot of things that 
are exactly what the Heaven's Gate cult did because um, the positioning of the, the bodies after the suicide, the purple cloths that were on them, the Heaven's Gate did the exact same thing, all that stuff. So I think they probably stole a lot or borrowed a lot from Heaven's Gate, which, by, uh, by the way, if anyone's interested in knowing anything about cults and how they operate and stuff like that there are some really good podcasts out there about it um one in particular there is a heaven's gate cult uh podcast you can just look for it it's i think it's just called heaven's gate to be honest and it's very fascinating um so just look for that on any podcatcher i recommend it so um them watching it further entrenches kind of their distrust and actually maybe some paranoia at that point um and it's like a dual purpose at this point because obviously they're watching it because they're curious about um, who Grace is. And, and they, they do a search on her and they find out, you know, that she was involved in this cult, the suicide cult. And there's that aspect of it, of them just kind of learning, which, like I was saying, kind of builds more distrust and potentially more paranoia about who she is. And not only, not only like, do kids not want a step parent in the first place and are they're distrustful of them in the first place, but then you find out some sort of crazy thing from her past like that. And it just deepens that. But the other aspect of it is as you go through the film, you realize that they take a lot of what they saw in that and a lot of the research they were doing and incorporate it into this plan that they had going on where they were messing with her to basically make her lose it and to try and scare her, either scare her away or make her seem unstable enough that they could talk their father into getting rid of her. So it's it's a dual purpose thing of them watching that. You can see the discomfort on the kids' faces in the car as Grace gets in for the first time. It, it felt like that was the very first time that they had met her. I don't know if that's the case. I would assume that's not the case if he's already talking about marrying her. I assume they would have met her, but it felt like it was the first time. And just the, the acting of the, those kids in the car, like you could definitely tell that they were very dis, um, very uncomfortable when she was getting into the car. And they did a really good job of showing that with their faces. That was some great acting, in my opinion. And actually, overall, the acting in this is very excellent, I will say. The landscape around the kids in this film uh, kind of seems to be an actual representation of them kind of internally. They're cold, they're barren emotionally, uh, emotionally, and it's truly a frigid winter that they are going through internally, emotionally, all that. Because, you know, you got to think about what they were uh, mentally and emotionally going through. You know, they lose their mother, and then not long after that, they have someone step in who they don't trust, who's been involved in a suicide cult, and who is basically trying to replace their mother who they just lost, who lost who they haven't even finished grieving for so it's a you know it's a terrible situation when grace goes through the ice when they're out there kind of like you know when the doll falls into the the little fishing hole and then the ice fishing hole and then grace goes in and she falls in um they put a lot of focus on the doll that she got out of there and it kind of felt to me at that point that they were trying to make some sort of like voodoo doll uh, point about that but that ended up actually going away but it was just something I thought with the way they kind of like focused the camera on the doll once it was pulled out after she went through the ice because it was like felt like you know the doll went into the water and then she went into the water so it was, it was like a voodoo doll or something I don't know uh, Mia showing Grace the family video where she was like oh do you want to see what we got our dad for Christmas was like an intentional move to show that she's not welcome. I mean, it was obviously an intentional move to say, watch this. We still have these memories. We are giving these memories to our father to remind him of our mother at not you. We don't have play, a place for you here. And it's got to be particularly hard for them because uh, through some of the dialogue early on, you understand that that's kind of a tradition, like a family tradition, and the mom would go with them to this lodge so literally Grace, they're trying to insert Grace, or at least Richard is, trying to insert Grace into the mother's spot, which is just, I mean, really we can kind of say it was all his fault, I guess. Just saying. I love that they watch John Carpenter's The Thing. First of all, I love The Thing, but I think it ties into this film extremely well. 
It's a movie about being isolated and not being able to trust anyone you're trapped with. Sound familiar? That's the film. I mean, Grace doesn't end up trusting the kids. The kids don't trust her either. Even though they know they're the ones kind of pulling the strings, they still don't trust her. And then they get to an even deeper moment of not trusting her when they realize that even after they come clean about what they were doing, they can't stop what they put into motion. Uh, they messed up. They messed up big time. With all the nightmares that Grace ends up having in this, it's obvious that she has severe PTSD from being in that cult. Uh, that's a pretty common thing, actually. That is a thing. People who are in cults, like, they have to do a lot of work to become a, I don't want to say normal person, but become comfortable living in, in our, you know, normalized current society. They do, a, uh, they do a good job of creating such a murky situation that you kind of don't know, is Grace losing it, or are these kids just pulling all the strings and she's not able to figure that out? Um, and do, 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 do. I mean, they do a good job of kind of like stringing it out. So for a, a good segment of the film, I really wasn't 100% sure what was going on. If it was all Grace losing it, if it was all the kids just messing with her, actually for a little component uh, or a little portion of the time, if there was a supernatural aspect at play in this, uh, but that idea went out relatively quickly. Um, so yeah, it just kept me kind of guessing like what is actually going on until the reveal with her finding the dog frozen outside and then the kids decide to come clean because they're like, okay, well this has gone too far and she's clearly losing it. But at that point it was a runaway train that they just could not stop. Um, uh, the, oh, and also I would say that what this does by setting it up like that and making you feel like kind of unsure about it, it actually, it's much like the movie, the thing going back to that, uh, they don't trust each other and the audience doesn't trust the characters. Cause when you watch John Carpenter's, the thing, it's the same thing. All the characters don't trust each other, but the audience doesn't trust the characters either. And I felt like making it so um, kind of veiled as to what is actually going on here. Is it Grace losing it, or is it the kids just pulling her, you know, yanking her leg? Um, you as an audience member can't trust anyone, and I kind of felt that going through it, so much like the thing. The use of dolls in this and the dollhouse was pretty creepy, but used well, in my opinion. It actually made me think a little bit about the film Hereditary, because it's used really well in there as well. Uh, I could really do out uh, do without the moment where Grace is kind of like walking around the house at night. I think potentially sleepwalking at that point. And there's like super aggressive loud organ music being used. I could 100% do without that. It was terrible. Uh, that was a big misstep. I, it, it just it clashed with what was going on in my opinion. There's definitely a psychosis component to Grace since she has been off of her meds. A large indicator of that is not only her walking around and having those kind of nightmares, but it's also her going outside with no plan. When she decides to leave, she does pack up some provisions so she's not 100% without a plan, but she doesn't have a plan of like where is she going to get to, how long is it going to take, you know, and she what she didn't even have like the clothing for all of that either. She just takes off. So you, at that moment, you're kind of like, you, like, you know at that point that she hasn't had her meds in a while because the kids hid those in addition to a bunch of other stuff. But you, um, that's a clear moment where you're just like, oh, yeah, um, this is really taking effect. She's been without her meds for a while. She's definitely losing it at this point. The image of the sea monkey falling to the bottom of the jar against the ice-laden window was phenomenal. That looks so good. It's a wonderful image. And it's a perfect example of things coming to an end, basically. It's, it's all hope is gone. The last surviving sea monkey has finally died and it is plummeting to the bottom. And no one can be saved at this point, basically. I had a feeling it was a combination of the kids messing with Grace and then her psychosis getting thrown into the mix. The kids slowly peeled away all the work she'd done to undo the cult teaching until they couldn't stop what they had done at that point. They basically re-indoctrinated her into the cult through messing with her so much. They used all the teachings and practices of the cult, what they had learned that they were able to find online, in order to drive her a little bit crazy. Now, their intention was to get rid of her that way, but what they actually ended up doing, especially when they took her meds, 
uh, because that took away a, a chemical barrier that could have helped not re-indoctrinate her. Um, they drove her back to the cult, basically. And, and that kind of speaks to an issue of once you've been indoctrinated with something, there's always an ability to, to be driven back there. It's something that's very deep-seated in your psyche. It's something that's ingrained into your, into your head because that's how indoctrination works. That's how cults work. They condition you with a lot of stuff, and that's what happens in this film. When Richard finds the dollhouse, it makes me think that the kids actually use that dollhouse as basically a diorama to plan out everything they were going to end up doing to Grace. Also, you need to recall that when they were packing up to leave the house in the beginning to go out to the, the lodge initially, the way it was shot made it feel like they were actually preparing for something. It kind of felt like it was a sh how they would shoot things like in a movie where like someone's about to go to war and they, they're like packing things up and like getting all their provisions and, and gear ready. That's how it was kind of shot. And I remember when I was watching that, I was like, it seems like they're prepping for something. So I had a feeling they were going to mess with her, but I didn't know to what degree. And um, it did make me question it not long after when it kind of seemed like she was, you know, losing it as well. And I will say though, it doesn't seem realistic that these kids would be able to really pull off what they pulled off in this film. They seem a little too smart, a little too organized, and a little too devious and evil. Just saying. Even though they cut to black to end the film, Grace definitely kills those kids. 100%. And you, can no you know there are indicators there because, first of all, she killed Richard. We know that. She's already been re-indoctrinated into the cult way of thinking. And she put the sins duct tape on the mouths of the kids, which is something that is on all the dead bodies you see who were involved with the cult. So that is your indicator. That duct tape saying sins on it is your indicator that that's it. The kids die. They just don't want to show it on screen. So this, uh, this whole thing plays the idea of how with any step parent entering a family, the spirit of the prior parent looms very, very large. Um, it, it's always a very contentious relationship. And this is just kind of takes that idea of how hard it is for a step parent to kind of come into a family and replace another parent. That's always tough. This kind of takes it and, and takes it to a kind of ridiculous level. Um, yeah, to make it a, a truly horrific film. And like I was saying in the beginning, a lot of people say it's very bleak. It is very bleak, but that's what horror is people. So, um, I said I like this film uh, out of five stars with half stars in play. I'm going to give it a good four-star rating. I thought it was, was quite nice, and I would recommend it to people. I, I do feel like maybe it was a little bit too drawn out and slow at times it, when it wasn't necessary. There is some slowness that's needed for the kind of gradual um, layers falling away from Grace and her kind of going back to the cult way of thinking, but as slow as it was, they could have cut it down a little bit more, I think. But, you know, good film otherwise. So put some comments down here. If you've seen The Lodge, let's talk about that, especially if you have differing opinions. Either way, you liked it more, you didn't like it as much, you felt the same, whatever. Uh, do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button, because if you like any videos I do, that is your way to repay me. Uh, just hit that subscribe. And if you do, just make sure you also hit the notification bell. That way you know every time I put up new reviews or unboxings, because I do those every now and then, or when I'm going live, because I'm doing some live streams, doing more in-depth talk about films. Um, and if you've already subscribed, just hit that like button so you can you know, let me know, hey, I'm still watching. But regardless, thanks for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.